Well, welcome to The National Pulse. I'm Raheem Kassam, editor-in-chief of thenationalpulse.com, broadcasting to you live from downtown here in Washington, D.C. We've got a packed-out show for you today. In just a moment, Phil Klein will be joining us, the former Attorney General of Kansas and the director of the Armistad Project, also involved with this organization, got-freedom.org, gotfreedom.org. We're going to be talking about ballot security, uh, the Electoral College, and this extraordinary op-ed that Phil has out today in Real Clear Politics about Act Blue, this Democrat fundraising platform that we've written about before on the National Pulse. Phil has some exclusive information from an Amistad study. We'll also be speaking with Tim Brown, 9-11 survivor, somebody who was on with us uh, last week for the 9-11 special that we had planned. However, unfortunately, at the time, uh, there was live uh, feeds from the White House that we had to cut to. So we want to bring Tim back on today and make sure we hear his very moving story. Before we bring Phil Klein on, I want to turn to my colleague Natalie Winters here in studio. Natalie, long time no see. The audience is always complaining when you're not around. Um, so we brought you back. Um, we've got so many stories up on the National Pulse that we've been working on the last couple of days. I want to start with this uh, Atlantic magazine story that you have up went up about an hour ago in incredibly important because of course the Atlantic magazine was the was the ground zero for the assault on President Trump over the last two weeks, right? It was the place that the establishment media kept referring to, kept referring other people to, kept saying this is just an amazing magazine and we have to trust its reporting, can't question it, and then of course its reporting began to fall apart. But that's not all The Atlantic has been doing in the last couple of weeks. Give us, a, give us an idea. Yes, The Atlantic is effectively the propaganda arm of the Transition Integrity Project. So to refresh on what exactly the Transition Integrity Project is, at the top you have George Soros, the Chinese Communist Party, through the Berggruen Institute, which has a host of party apparatchiks on its board, along with President Obama, his former White House counsel, chief associate counsel, actually, and nearly 22 uh, alums of that administration who work with the organization that funds the project. On the next level down, you have Rosa Brooks and Nils Gilman. The former is a former chief counsel to George Soros. She's offered, quote, substantive help to the Clinton campaign. And then you have Nils Gilman, who's linked to the Chinese Communist Party, a foreign government which is keen on securing a Biden victory. Nonetheless, this In group, their own words. Exactly. Nonetheless, this group insists that they're bipartisan, which is a total farce. And so now you really see the media uh, really running as PR agents for the Transition Integrity Project, and specifically you see the Atlantic perpetuating their bogus narratives, whether it's the fact that President Trump is going to not concede the election should he lose, or that the Electoral College should be done away with and completely abolished. You see them citing not only authors and uh, scholars who've participated in the Transition Integrity Project's war games where they threaten secession if President Trump rightly assumed the presidency. Uh, for a second time. Exactly. But you also see individuals who they've cited in their seminal report uh, as being quoted in these these articles, a host of articles, really several occurring in just over the course of two weeks. And they have it. And we've got the articles on screen there so people can see. I want to make sure we get those up and keep those up. Um, but we haven't um, we haven't seen any reporting from this news outlet, supposed news outlet, about the background of the Transition Integrity Project, who they are, who they're connected to, where their money is coming from, as we exposed here and on the National Pulse website uh, last week. That's not reporting. Exactly. That's publishing press releases. The only description you ever see of the Transition Integrity Project is the fact that it's bipartisan or nonpartisan, which, as we've exposed, again, not only through the founders of the project as explicit Democrats who funneled over $20,000 to a host of Democratic campaigns, including uh, presidential candidate Joe Biden, uh, but also just through the fact that they are funded by an organization that, as I said before, retains over 20 former Obama White House staffers. Uh, who've been around since day one of the Trump presidency, been around with impeachment attempts, Russia collusion hoaxes, really just keen on undermining the Trump presidency in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, and I've seen today that uh, 
Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is on his way to a new uh, think tank and organization. He's going to be sitting alongside H.R. McMaster uh, as a fellow at this organization. We'll be reporting that exclusively on the National Pulse website over the next couple of days as well. Keep your eyes on that. Natalie, just before we go to the break, then I want to bring Phil Klein on. You stick around, though, uh, uh, you know, especially if you have questions as well uh, in, during that interview. Um, the Atlantic magazine has long been seen as the, the, the kind of Atlanticists, um, it's just, it's, it's the, they, they choose it when they want to uh, advance arguments. There have been great essays in the Atlantic over the past that at least tells you where the globalists are going with their thought processes. It's actually kind of sad to see it just go into this role of just publishing press releases from an organization that they're not actually willing to tell their readers any more about. Any more about than just here's this group, you know, barely tell you who's involved with it. They never tell you it's linked with the Chinese Communist Party through the Bagruan Institute. Um, but they keep churning out these op eds and think, yeah. isn't there somebody at the Atlantic? who worked on the Transition Integrity Project? Yes, David Froome, who's a staff writer there, actually has been identified as, as I believe it was, helping shape. That was a direct quote from this Rosa This staff Brooks. writer is on tip, works on these war games, and then they write about tip. Shouldn't they be disclosing that in their article somewhere? Exactly, and it's never been disclosed. Uh, all you see is the group just described positively in their findings of that report that we have up on the site. Uh, presented rather uncritically, uh, taking their word as, as fact, which, as we know, is completely absurd. Right, completely absurd. You wouldn't expect it to be done from anyone else. You wouldn't expect us to do it. You wouldn't expect uh, any real reporter worth their weight in ink to do it. But this is exactly what The Atlantic magazine is doing right now. I wanted to keep you abreast of that story. It's, on the, it's the lead story on the National Pulse right now. The Atlantic magazine is laundering Transition Integrity Project talking points. Want to make sure you're all sharing that. You're all going to the National National Pulse's social media pages, following, subscribing on YouTube. We'll be back with Phil Klein to tell us more about what's going on with ballot integrity right after this break. Well, this is the book I was telling you all about yesterday. It's called Ballot Battles. It's by uh, Professor Edward Foley. And I'm going through it very slowly, as you can see, going through it uh, very closely to figure out what the arguments are from the Transition Integrity Project, because they use this as their um, go-to document. This has got everything that they believe in in it. The attacks on the Electoral College, the attacks on election night norms, uh, the attacks on long-standing procedures here in the United States about how you deal with contested elections. Ed Foley and this book uh, really is, 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 is um, Rosa Brooks and the Transition Integrity Team's uh, Bible right now of how to destroy and attack the American Constitution and its norms. But somebody who is trying to defend all of those Robusty is Phil Klein. Phil is the director of the Amistad Project, the former attorney general for Kansas. And you can catch all, all of his work at got-freedom.org. Phil joins us now. Thank you so much, Phil, for, for being on the show today. Great to be with you, Raheem. Phil, I just wanted to get your initial thoughts on what you heard from us in the, uh, in the first segment there about The Atlantic magazine. I remember reading The Atlantic magazine uh, about five, ten years ago and thinking, oh, you know, this is fine. I understand it's got a slant. It's got a bent. It's very much of the interventionist, Atlanticist uh, type of mindset, but it's still worth reading. I don't think it's worth reading anymore. Yeah, there's it, you, you hear from the left all the time that we speak about conspiracies. And what they're really saying is that the left will not plan. In other words, they don't get everybody together who supports changing this country to execute a plan to do just that. And the reality is, they're very, very good at planning. They're very, very good at dedicating resources. And they've co-opted many of this, these messengers into that plan. And that's what's happened to the Atlantic. Um, I appreciate you mentioning George Soros. He's been playing in American elections heavily for several years now. And there is an effort to fundamentally reorder the nature of our government.
Well, George Soros is the reason my family went bankrupt in 1992, so I have a specific place in hell for him. Um, Phil, I want to uh, get to from the not so sublime in the Atlantic to the sublime, which is your op ed in Real Clear Politics at the moment. You're really doing uh, some great work exposing some of these groups. Act Blue raises millions in suspicious gift card donations. Tell us more. Well, Act Blue is the Goliath of leftist fundraising. They've moved over six billion dollars to leftist causes since 2004, and in the last year, over 900 million dollars into political campaigns and causes on the left. So we've collected all of that data, tens of millions of records, and we've run through it and realized that over 48 percent of their donations totaling over $354 million in the last year came from the unemployed, those who had no job. How does that happen? The reaction is the same. It raises serious questions about how they get their money and how they use their money. Now, we did the same analysis on the Republican uh, version of Act Blue, and it's called Win Red. And they, they are not as robust. They ra- raised a little bit less than half the money. But those that, the donations that came from the unemployed were 4.7 percent roughly matching the unemployment rate in 2009. So we took it another step, and we went to Biden for president. 50% of the donations were from the unemployed. Trump for president, 2.7%. And Wait, and what, wait Phil, what Phil, these are, these are bombshell yeah. numbers here. Um, how is this not on the front page of every newspaper in the country right now? What, what is that telling us about these donations? Well, it it tells us that we need to take a very serious look at their fundraising activities. And and Act Blue has also negotiated a special relationship with banks where with gift card donations, they do not have to verify the owner of the account or who purchased the gift card. So they've opened up a door where massive amounts of monies can be moved in a virtually untraceable manner and avoid FEC scrutiny, and that is of concern as well. So there's a lot here. Uh, Why is it not being reported? Well, I think you know the answer to that as well as I. Um, I think of concern is a massive understatement, Phil. Let me get this straight, and let's, because that's a bombshell you're dropping on the audience here. Let's, firstly, I didn't even know you can give money through gift cards. How, how, How does that happen? They purchase a gift card that is dedicated to Act Blue, and Act Blue distributes those funds to the to various accounts. They they also have a method, Raheem, where if you are giving, uh, let's say you give a thousand dollars, and you you split it, they will send it to various uh, campaigns around the nation. Now that that is perfectly legal and it's effective. But the way that they approach it can also deceive a person as to where the money is going. You, you have issues where Act Blue is the, is the vendor to process payments for, example, if you go and adopt a cat and the animal shelter uses Act Blue, then your payment will move through that portal and Act Blue takes a portion of that. And they also have uh, they participate in what are called 527 packs. Um, you know, those, those packs that move mammoth amounts of monies. And so a person adopting a cat might not know that a portion of the payment is going to act blue to rededicate to things they might not support. So there's, there's an awful lot of, of questions to be asked of act blue. Do, do, do Phil, do uh, a lot of retailers use act blue as a payment processor? Well, I, I would encourage you, it's, it's um, 501Cs and charities. You can go to the Act Blue site, and they have a directory of those who use their service. And you can just search in that directory, and all kinds of groups will pop up. Wow. Well, we will definitely be going through that and letting the audience know who is using Act Blue and what they should be watching out for. You've got more news for us, though. Phil, I feel like you should be uh, hosting or uh, editing the National Post with all the scoops you've got. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and what you guys have found out about Mark Zuckerberg and his involvement and others' involvement 
in this election. Um, it, we talked about it just before the show, and it just sounds extraordinary to me. Phil, we're really grateful for your time. Hang around. We're going to go to a quick break now. Phil Klein's op-ed is up on Real Clear Politics. It's been up since this morning. We're going to link to it. I'm going to tweet it. I'm actually going to make sure that it goes on all the aggregators as well, uh, Phil, if the, uh, if the aggregators will be so kind to put it up there and get some, drive some real traffic to it. It's called Act Blue Raises Millions in Suspicious Gift Card Donations. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and from what Phil told us just now, you're going to want to make sure that you communicate this with as many people as possible. The National Pulse returns with me, Raheem Kassam, Phil Klein. I'm a stat project and former attorney general for Kansas. In just a second, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the National Pulse. I'm Raheem Kassam. Just looking at some of the comments in the live chat and... Um, Bill Klein, you've really, you've really blown some uh, some of people's heads away with this information uh, that you're bringing us about Act Blue. The story up on uh, Real Clear Politics right now. We're also we'll also have a link to it through the National Pulse as well, so that all of our audience can find it. Also, it'll go out to our list. Get more eyes on this. Uh, just the more eyes on this, the better. It's just exactly the type of thing that we've been covering, Phil, with the Transition Integrity Project. What I've just started referring to is the steel, right? And some people refer to as the coup. Uh, what these guys have got in place and what they're doing at this election is truly baffling. Um, and as I say, this book, uh, Ballot Battles, it actually kind of gives you their, uh, their playbook for after the election as well, how they want to deface and vandalize the US Constitution. Uh, so I'm going through all of that and figuring out exactly where we're going next. But that's these aren't the only people. Uh, billionaires also in the fold here. We talked about George Soros in the first segment. Let's talk about another one. Let's talk about Mark Zuckerberg. Phil, what uh, have you and the Amistad uh, Project and, and your colleagues found out about Mark Zuckerberg's involvement in this election? Well, two weeks ago, Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan announced a $250 million grant to a sleepy little charity called the Center for Tech and Civic Life. They had run about $700,000 a year in their budget previously. And then they get this $250 million from Zuckerberg, as well as Google money. And we've been tracking where that money goes. And what they're doing is they are targeting grants to cities. So they're getting cities involved in the effort to turn out the vote. And these grants have so far gone to five cities in Wisconsin, to Detroit, to Atlanta, to Charleston, South Carolina, and to Philadelphia. And those jurisdictions gave Hillary Clinton over 80% of the vote in 2016. But what you've got is now government playing favorites in elections. The, the government officials will spend the money to turn out the vote in those areas for so-called safe elections. And the Zuckerberg money is so mammoth that our calculations are, for example, in Michigan, the state gives $250 per precinct to run an election. The Zuckerberg money would give $100 for every $1 the rest of the state would have to run their election. And the problem is, government shouldn't play favorites. Imagine, Raheem, if the NRA announced that it had given 250 counties $1 million to send government officials to go collect ballots to make sure that everybody voted in counties where the Second Amendment is supported by 90% of the electorate. We'd have a firestorm of controversy. This type and rightly of targeted, so. yes, and, and think about this. This is government targeting a demographic for turnout. That's the opposite side of the same coin as government targeting a demographic to suppress the vote. We have seen this before. It was the tactic of the Democratic Party in the Deep South when they made it real hard, if not impossible, for blacks to vote and very easy for whites to vote. This is just dressed up as charity and it should not stand. Mr. Zuckerberg, if he wants to turn out the vote, can give the government the money at the state level where they can appropriate it evenly. Or he could even give it to the Democratic Party. That's allowed. But he is taking a tax deduction, 
getting a nonprofit to purchase government elected officials and giving them the resources to turn out Hillary votes for Biden. And it's a problem. If, wow. if allowed, it'll start an arms race where where billionaires are going to be buying up these cities to turn out the vote for their candidates and we'll end up with privately run elections. We can't let this we can't let it happen. So what does the audience do? We have a very activist audience out there that watch this show every day and that watches the war room at, at 10 a.m. Um, on Real America's Voice. The, the new name for this network just changed today, in case you were wondering, Phil. Um, what can this audience do themselves? What actions can they take to avert this crisis? Well, I think there's a, a couple of things. First, we are litigating. We have sued in Wisconsin. We will be moving forward in other states where this money pops up. You can go to god-freedom.org. It explains the story. And if you can, all the support for our litigation is greatly appreciated. And then you need to raise your voice with your state elected officials, your representatives uh, or and your senators and your local officials to say, look, we should treat every voter equally. So funds are coming in to make sure that elections are run safe and, and that everybody has an opportunity to vote, then we should make sure that that is spread out equally across the state. I will also add this, and this is a, this is a particularly, um, uh, I think, insidious manner in which they are playing this out. You have blue state governors who are using COVID to discourage voting and actually encourage shutting down in-person voting. So they're reducing the opportunity to vote in red jurisdictions, while this money used by local government officials is enhancing the opportunity to vote in the urban core where Biden is expected to win. Government playing that game is not proper. Campaigns, that's what they do, but not government. Bill, it's just it's a mountain of information and I'm so glad that you guys are out there monitoring this stuff. I thought we were good here at the National Pulse. You guys are amazing. That's incredible. Can you tell our audience just again quickly where they can follow you, your work? Uh, what websites should they be bookmarking and, and checking on a daily basis to get to get the most out of you guys? Yes, it's got-freedom.org and, and they are staying up on this. Yeah, fantastic. Phil, just before we let you go, we've got about a minute left here. What do you portend for the, uh, for the mail-in ballots after this election, after uh, November the 3rd? Well, I, I believe there's going to be a dramatic effort to try to suspend state law and count ballots that were after received after the deadline. It'll be targeted in certain areas where it's likely that possibly those ballots go to the Democratic Party, and we need to respect the rule of law. When did the left lose faith in democracy? These laws have been passed. They've been signed by governors. They should apply. You can't change the election rules constantly at the last minute. That's not fair. Completely agree. Phil, you're just amazing uh, at your research, your work. Uh, open invitation, honestly, to come back any time and talk to us about what you guys are doing. Phil Klein, Got Freedom, Got a hyphen freedom, or Got Dash Freedom dot org. I'm Raheem Kassam. We'll be back with more National Pulse in just a second. Well, our next guest, uh, we wanted to have him on last week, but uh, things just didn't work out, I'm afraid, at the time. Uh, it was just an incredibly, incredibly busy week for everyone, and I know Tim Brown had so many interviews that he was doing himself. We had the president chiming in over us on the uh, on the 3 p.m. hour as well, but we're all right with that, aren't we, Tim? Uh, Tim Brown is a 9-11 uh, a, a survivor and just has a, just an incredible story to tell, so I wanted to uh, ha have off as much of this show as possible for you, Tim. You're also doing some work with the uh, um, Tunnel to Towers Foundation, which is just an extraordinary uh, group that put on this big uh, commemoration at 9-11 down here in Washington, D.C. last week, and I know in New York also, and um, and in Pennsylvania. Uh, just a, just a, a great entity, and, and we're really grateful for you guys and what you do. So, Tim, I, I just, you know, I'm going to start at the very top, because I, I started last week by talking about um, 
9-11 for me, I was 15 years old on the other side of the world uh, watching from my you know, box room in my parents' house uh, as I just you know, couldn't believe what I was seeing in front of my eyes. I had been to the World Trade Center on vacation with my family just a year before. I think it was exactly a year um, before just awful and, 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 and stunning to me and just life-changing in the sense that it really made me look at um, radical Islam. I was raised in a Muslim family, but it made me look at radical Islam in a whole new light and, and, and spurred me on to do something about it. I, I know the audience really wants to hear you and your story, so why don't you just take us away? What, what, what are the memories of that day for you, Tim? I mean, the day started out absolutely gorgeous. A storm had come through and uh, it was just a beautiful, beautiful, clear sky uh, a day. Uh, I was a New York City firefighter, but I was actually had taken off my helmet uh, because Mayor Giuliani had asked me to come work in his office of emergency management. So, um, you know, I, I was wearing a tie. I was going to Monday through Friday kind of work schedule. And um, my office was in Seven World Trade Center. So we were right in the World Trade Center complex. And I went in that morning uh, around eight, and I always went to the third floor cafeteria where I uh, had some food and uh, my little breakfast, and I read the newspapers because we didn't have smartphones back then, uh, and just to catch up on the happenings of the day. The, the power went out in our building, which was very unusual for a modern high-rise building in New York City, and, and then the power came back on, so I knew we were on generator power. I didn't know what happened. I knew something big happened, but I didn't know what it was. And uh, uh, the people who were facing the glass that looked out the window at the North Tower uh, uh, all stood up and ran toward us screaming, uh, trying to get to the exit. Uh, and I had to actually physically stop one lady by the shoulders and like shake her back to reality and say what happened. And she said a plane hit the tower. And so that's what I knew. Uh, I went up to the office, did a few things quick up there. M my job was to represent the mayor at the command post. Uh, so my job was to go to the command post in the North Tower, uh, the first tower to be hit. Uh, I went to my car and I got my helmet and uh, mayor's office jacket and all that on. And we're trained as firefighters to always look at three sides of a building that's under destruction uh, uh, before we go in so we have a size up. So that's what I did. Uh, when I looked out over the plaza in between the towers, it was littered with debris that was on fire, uh, smoke. And if you remember seeing the video of all the paper that was knocked out of the office offices of the tower that was like fluttering down. And uh, that's what it looked like. And I started to understand that it wasn't it was possibly bigger than a small plane. Uh, I went into the North Tower at that plaza level and I had to go down an escalator. And this always stuck with me. One of the things I saw that, that stayed with me was that there were hundreds of pe civilian people, office workers, trying to get on this escalator to go down. And uh, uh, I saw, I noticed what they were not doing. They were not pushing and screaming and trampling each other. In fact, for every person who was obese or pregnant or injured or disabled, there were four or five office workers helping that person, not firefighters or police officers, office workers. And I just said to myself in that moment, no matter what happens today, we're going to be all right, because that's the true human spirit. When people, when someone's down, most people want to pick them up and help them and, and brush them off and carry them if necessary, you know? And I just thought that was a powerful moment. Uh, I got into the kind of that uh, funnel with the hundreds of people trying to get on the escalator. And I went down the escalator. Uh, I looked out over the lobby. There were hundreds of firefighters awaiting their assignments. And uh, when I got to the bottom of the escalator, firefighter Chris, Chris Blackwell was right in front of me. And I had worked with Chris in the Bronx for uh, about seven years. We were very close. And... Uh, we came face to face, and uh, we always greeted each other the same way. Um, we, we stand up straight at attention. Uh, he took an unlit, unlit stub of a cigar out of his mouth. We will both lean in, kiss on the lips, stand back up, and he would put the cigar back in his mouth. 
and we we thought it was pretty funny because it freaked out all the other firemen but the truth was i really love this man like like he was my own brother and uh he said to me timmy this is really bad i said i know chris be careful i love you and he said i love you and he went in that stairwell and he went up after he said it's really bad he knew what he was doing raheem he knew he was going up and he knew there was a good chance he was not coming back he still did it i heard someone yell my name across the crowd of firefighters and it was my best friend terry hatton he was six four i ran over to terry he was the captain of rescue one kind of the elite firefighters of the manhattan fire department and he had the halligan his helmet his coat the, the pry bar and his light and he just wrapped his ar his huge arms around me and he squeezed me to his chest and he kissed me right here on the cheek and he said i love you brother i may never see you again and i blew him off but terry was the smart one i, I was like yeah i'll see you later but terry was a smart one right and after he said that to me he turned around and he grabbed his men and they went in the stairwell and they went up Tim, uh, I hate to cut you off right there. We've got to go to a break really quickly, but just okay. hold that thought. I want to come back because that wasn't your first, um, you know, incident in the uh, in the World Trade Center. For so for you, I mean, I know you survived both uh, in the '93 attack as well. So I want to hear just exactly how you must have felt uh, knowing you had survived a previous attempt at terrorist attack, and then this one. We'll be back with more National Pulse. In a second. Well, one of the books that was written in the aftermath of 9-11 is a book called What Brothers Do, and it's by Dr. Michael Everett Brown, former uh, FDNY firefighter and emergency medicine physician. What Brothers Do recounts his story of searching for his brother, the former U.S. Marine and highly decorated FDNY captain Patrick Brown at Ground Zero in the days after 9-11. I want to make sure that everybody watching this picks up a copy of this book. I started reading it last week. The uh, the proceeds of this book, it was originally written in 2010. They've relaunched it um, re recently. And the proceeds of this book are all going to the... Um, uh, Tunnel to Towers Foundation, which just does an amazing job in supporting uh, the families of those affected and wider military families as well. So I want to make sure that you guys are all getting that. What Brothers Do is uh, is just an incredible book. And our guest is Tim Brown. Tim, no relation. Right, no no relation. It's a little confusing, but uh, <laughs> they, they have adopted, their, their, their family has adopted me. So I guess I could say there is a relationship there. They've They've uh, welcomed me with open arms, and uh, uh, of course, um, as much as I loved Patrick uh, before he was murdered uh, by radical Islamic terrorists, uh, I love his brother Mike uh, and his sister Carolyn just as much. And and uh, uh, very sadly now, Mike is uh, um, in suffering very badly from 9/11 uh, cancer from searching through the rubble for his brother Patrick. Uh, so that's why I've kind of become the voice uh, uh, to try and get the book out there, try and get the story out there, uh, and, and, uh, and try, you know, with the proceeds going to Tunnel to Tower. So it's, a, it's all good. Yeah, well, I hope you can tell us a little bit about uh, Michael's story in just a moment. But I want to come back to you on what we left off in the last segment. Uh, you actually survived the 93 attack on the World Trade Center, is that right? I res yes, I responded to it uh, as a firefighter. Uh, I wound up, uh, initially I was going to go, one firefighter, my friend Kevin Shea from Rescue One, had actually uh, uh, tumbled into the crater and fell many stories down into the, the bomb crater. Uh, and so initially I was going to get him, but by the time uh, I got to that spot, they, they were already uh, tending to him. So I wound up going up all 110 stories of, of the South Tower. Uh, it was very, very heavy smoke condition from all the cars and, and fuel that was burning from the bomb. Uh, so we were very concerned about uh, people in the stairwells uh, being, you know, overcome by smoke. So I, I ran. I was in pretty good shape then. Uh, so I ran up the 110 stories. Wow. 
That's incredible. Let me ask you a question, Tim. You, um, you used the phrase, your, your friend was murdered by radical Islamic terrorists, um, rather than, I think a lot of us refer to, you know, people who died or who perished um, on 9-11. And, I, and, I, and I'm on your side when, when you use that, and it kind of struck me when you said it. Actually, yeah, we should refer to it more like that. Tell us why you, why you phrase it like that. Um, because it's the, it's the truth. Uh, if, if we don't speak the truth po pointedly, if we don't speak it pointedly, then we, we do a disservice to the, the memory and the lives of all those innocent people, the 2,977 uh, uh, innocent souls who just went to work that day, or the seven, you know, in, within that number, the seven, over 700 first responders uh, who went that day and and and, uh, and, and in, in the days after, you know, everyone, you know, we just buried another guy the other day, a uh, retired firefighter from 9-11 disease. They, they are also, uh, as is Mike Brown, uh, uh, victims of uh, an Islamist terrorist attack, uh, it, it, intentional. And, and, you know, these guys who are, are still alive, these terrorists who are still alive, uh, they say they're proud of what they did and they would do it again. And they, they say that right to our face. They say it to the media. And, and, and we have to take them at their word. You know, yeah. it's it's a it's an ideological struggle, uh, and and you know, well, we can get into it. But anyhow, these they, they were my friends. I, I lost over a hundred of my friends, uh, yeah. and if if I don't speak properly about their lives and what happened to them, then I have not fulfilled my obligation uh, to them to never forget. I can't imagine what it's like losing so many people that, that you love around you, uh, losing them all at, effectively e either at once or in the coming years because of the same, the same incident, the same atrocity, the same terrorist attack, and, 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 and still getting up as you do every day and, and representing them and doing such an amazing job of it. I know they would be all incredibly grateful, Tim, for, for what you're doing and, and, and raising the money and helping out with the Tunnel to Towers project. It's just incredibly commendable. And I know I don't have to say that to somebody like you, but I, I, just, I just think you should hear it and know it. And I know the audience out there believes the same, that, that you know, we're just taken aback by, by people like you and your stories and your bravery and, and what you did that day and what you continue to do to this day. Tim, tell us about Michael. Tell us about Michael's story. Right. Michael uh, and Patrick were two years apart, and uh, um, Michael was a New York City firefighter uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, in, in, for four years. Uh, and then he, he had a higher calling. He wanted to be a doctor, so uh, he actually left the fire department and uh, went to medical school. He spent his years out in Nevada, out in Las Vegas, uh, as an ER physician, doing the same thing, helping people, same thing, you know, same kind of line of work. And, uh, um, and, and Mike wanted to specialize in, in not just helping any people, but he wanted to help uh, our military. And so he spent a lot of time in the military hospitals, uh, uh, helping to heal uh, our wounded and our sick uh, military members. Um, uh, and I did not know Michael before 9-11, but I got to know him very well in the aftermath through searching for Patrick's body and then the services, the memorial service and and funeral and, and then spreading his ashes. And uh, of course, I would love Michael as much as I loved Patrick. I mean, that, I guess that just makes sense, right? And, uh, and then Michael started getting sick uh, uh, maybe almost two years ago. Uh, and uh, it, it's this this terribly aggressive uh, uh, prostate cancer that got into his bones and then uh, you know throughout his bones throughout his body uh, yeah. is just rav ravishing him and and uh, Tim, I, I love I Tim, love just this hang on, ha just hang on because we've got to go to a break I want to hear more about Michael Michael's story but also uh, more about what you're doing now with the Tunnel to Towers Foundation we'll be back uh, with more National Pulse Tim Brown former FDNY firefighter and hero here on the National Pulse today. Stick around, we'll be right back.
was telling um, our guest Tim Brown in the break that I, I, I keep my eye on the on the charitable sector just because there's so very few. It seems like there's so very few, you know, reliable charities and foundations out there. You know, you go to find out how much money they're actually spending on their programs versus how much they're paying themselves in salaries, you know, what they actually do, who they're affiliated with and all this stuff. So and Tunnel to Towers came on uh, onto my radar a couple of years back and I noticed they had uh, some advertisements on television and started watching uh, what they were doing, found out that uh, uh, friends of mine were involved and then the Mayor Giuliani uh, was, is involved in one of the uh, one of the um, events that they host every year um, and it's just an incredible organization their website is tunnel2, the number two, tunnel2towers.org. I encourage all of you to go there and you know support them in any way you can. If you can't give any money, then share some of the things that they're doing. I'm sure they're just incredibly grateful to get the word out, to get the message out. Uh, and we're incredibly grateful to have Tim on, Tim Brown, to talk about it with us today. Tim, just, just finish up uh, telling us about Michael. Michael Brown is the author of this book, What Brothers Do, uh, re-released uh, just, uh, just uh, after being written in 2010. I started reading it last Last week, uh, it isn't for the faint of heart. It's 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 really, you know, heart wrenching stuff. A lot of swear words as well. Um, but but that's because these are real people, right? Living real, um, real horrific situations, and 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 that can happen. Um, Tim. Yeah, it, the book is uh, is raw. It's brutally honest. Um, the review on Amazon says it's the best book written about 9/11. Uh, I, I I happen to agree with it. Uh, but you know, Mike loved his brother with all his heart, and he came driving like a madman from Las Vegas to New York uh, to go dig through the rubble to find his his brother Patrick. And in in that process, as he was uh, meeting people uh, and going through Patrick's uh, uh, um, belongings and his car and all that, he he got. He was also learning about who his brother was and who his friends were and all the different amazing things that his brother had been up to. Uh, it, one of the funny stories when we had the uh, the memorial service, it was kind of, kind of like a wake, but we hadn't found Patrick's body yet. Uh, but we're in the funeral home and hundreds and hundreds of people are waiting in line because Patrick was very well liked and kind of famous in the fire department. And one this group of people came in of young people and they each had their hand on the shoulder of the person in front of them and they were like a snake coming into the to the funeral parlor and there was one older person leading them teresa and and so we went over to her and said well who who like who are you guys like w w every time we turn around we're being surprised by patrick's life and and she said well all these kids are are blind and uh, Patrick taught them karate because Patrick was a black belt in karate, but he didn't talk about it. He just volunteered to teach them karate. Uh, and uh, aside from his compassion for these young people, what we, what we learned later or figured out later on was that Patrick was also learning from them how to be a better firefighter. Because when you're a firefighter, you're in smoke. You can't see. It's like you're blind. And so you have to learn to use your other senses like blind people do. So not only was he giving to them, but they were giving to him. And in the book, Michael is discovering all these little stories about how wonderful and selfless and complicated uh, his brother Patrick was. Uh, the highest decorated New York City fireman murdered on September 11th, 2001. Uh, you know, if you look at my my few medals here, Patrick had dozens and dozens more uh, awards for saving people's lives. Uh, but he would leave. He wouldn't wear all of them on his chest because he didn't want to embarrass the other firemen with how many he had. That's how humble he was. He would only wear the few that meant the most to him. Uh, wow. And that's the story of this raw, honest book that yeah. Mike, Doc, Dr. Brown, who, who sh should be a, a writer because he's very, very good at it.
It's it's a very well written book. It's 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 thoroughly gripping, thoroughly. You know, I hate to use the word entertaining, but when you write a book, you are trying to keep the audience captivated. That's what you're doing, and he just does it in just an incredible manner. Uh, the book is so well written. It's called What Brothers Do. Tim, we've just got about a, a minute or two left here on the show. Uh, I wanted to ask about more about Tunnel to Towers, your involvement with them, and and what you recommend our audience to do to get involved. Yeah, I, I volunteer. I've been volunteering with them for years. Uh, they, it's the Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers Foundation. It's named after firefighter Stephen Siller, who was the youngest of five uh, children, and he also had five children. Stephen uh, r- was going through the tunnel, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, into Manhattan on September 11th, uh, and the traffic backed up. So he jumped out of the car and he grabbed his gear and he ran through the tunnel. And when he got to the other side, the building collapsed and killed him. Uh, His family, the next year, in 2002, decided to do a a fundraiser, a 5K fundraiser, running through the tunnel into Manhattan in Stephen's footsteps. Uh, 19 years later, uh, they have somewhere north of 35,000, maybe 40,000 people to do it. They raise an awful lot of money and they use the, initially use the money to build smart homes for catastrophically injured military. Uh, we have a real special relationship with the military. They are the ones who, who picked up the flag for us and uh, brought us justice. And, um, and now, we also use the Tunnel to Towers also uses the money uh, to pay off the mortgages of police officer and firefighters uh, killed in the line of duty uh, who, who have young children so that their families don't have to uh, worry about uh, their mortgage and they don't have to leave their home and, and uh, they can stay in their home. So it, it is wow. 93% of the, of the profits uh, or the money they raise, 93% yeah. goes to uh, the end user. So I'm very That's, proud of the chair. That is, that is the point, right? Tim, we're so grateful for you being with us today. I wish we had more time. You, you'll come back, I'm sure, and I hope uh, you'll come back again anytime you want. Tim Brown there just does such an incredible job. We're really grateful for him. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the end of the uh, end of the hour here. We'll see you again tomorrow at 3 p.m. right here. You're not going to want to miss it. Congressman Matt Gates will be with us. Uh, and some surprise guests over the next couple of days getting bigger, getting better, getting badder here on the National Pulse as we get closer and closer to November the 3rd. And what happens immediately after that? We'll see you tomorrow.